Good morning, everybody, and welcome. I'm delighted to bring our 2021 The Changing Face of Agriculture virtual event to you, streaming live from the Ludgate uh, in Spring. My name is Gronio O'Keefe, CEO of the Ludgate Hub, and I would like to take this opportunity to welcome all of our attendees today. I would particularly like to extend a warm welcome to our host, our speakers and our panelists, and a sincere thank you for making the time to attend and contribute. For those of you unfamiliar with Ludgate, we are Ireland's first rural digital hub. We opened our doors in the summer of 2016 and celebrated our five-year anniversary this summer. We're fortunate to have a state-of-the-art 10,000 square foot co-working space with one gigabyte connection brought to us by Vodafone and Syro. Our goal is to facilitate the economic growth and sustainability in the region. And in pursuing this objective, we have an impressive track record supporting sole traders, startups, scaling organizations, and second site strategies with supportive programs and services such as these knowledge exchanges. To date, we have facilitated the creation of approximately 130 direct and indirect jobs in the West Cork region. And these jobs have emerged from a wide range of sectors, including the agri and the food sector. And we would hope to achieve even greater success in the coming years. We've only just started. Our long-term vision is to make West Cork a centre of excellence for such organisations, allowing them to prosper and thrive at a global level from a rural location. So this is Ludgate's fifth annual Agri event. Last year was our first virtual event. Um, we've learned a huge amount about virtual event management in the interim, but bear with us if we do encounter any, any hiccups along the way. A little bit of housekeeping to point out. Uh, during the course of the morning, your microphones will be muted and your video will be off. All questions to the speakers, uh, panel and moderator are to be made via the Q&A panel, which hopefully you can access at the bottom of your Zoom screen. And uh, the moderator will collate and relay these questions back to the speakers and the panel on your behalf. If you want to chat with the uh, fellow attendees, you can do that via the chat panel to share your observations and comments. And you can also use the chat panel to connect with fellow attendees via the private chat. So we do encourage debate and forthright discussion but we do remind all attendees that this is a public forum and the event is being recorded. So be mindful of the tone and the content of your comments and questions. Now, moving on to today's topic, which is particularly relevant and of great interest to the agricultural sector. We, we know we're living in challenging times, you know, brought by a number of uh, very variables, you know, COVID, Brexit, the CAP strategic plan, the climate action plan, the nitrates action plan, and we're doing all that all while juggling a sustainable livelihood with a sustainable planet. I remember at last year's webinar, former commissioner uh, Phil Hogan pointed out that the sustainability in agriculture would not be mutually exclusive and how there needed to be greater compatibility and greater cohesion. And since then, much of the legislative framework has been articulated and it's a case of moving forward and executing on those strategies and plans and converting many of these challenges into opportunities where possible. This morning, we have an amazing lineup, lineup of leaders and experts, ranging from Minister McConnell, Secretary General Brendan Thiessen, who's actually here with us in the hub, broadcasting from our conference room, Harry Kingston, IFA Munster Regional Chair, Dario Fernana from Agricultural Food and Biosciences Institute, and a panel from the Dingle Peninsula, uh, Internet of Things Company, NetFasa and Chagas, sharing their story about leveraging technology to offer precision management to optimize productivity and yield while minimizing carbon emissions. So a recorded version of the webinar will be available to view on our website after the event and uh, an email will be sent out to each participant with the relevant link. Love to hear from you. Uh, we're available on all social media platforms as well as our email address info at .ie. Uh, So be sure to follow us there and give us your feedback. Ludgate is proudly sponsored by AIB, and this year's event is presented in association with AIB. So without further ado, I would like to hand you over to Head of AIB Cork, John O'Doherty, for some welcoming remarks. Thank you, Gráinne, and good morning, everybody, and good morning to the Minister and everyone in attendance today. So as Gráinne said, my name is John O'Doherty. I'm Head of AIB in Cork, and on behalf of myself and indeed some of my colleagues who are on the call today, I have to say we're delighted to join you for the, what promises to be hopefully a very informative conference over the next couple of hours. Gronia would have mentioned that we're in partnership with the Ludgate and we have been since day one and we've had the opportunity to support various events organized by the Ludgate over the years. 
So as a bank who at its core is a community bank with branches throughout Ireland, we strongly identify with the objectives of the Ludgate who do such good work in terms of rural sustainability. We have a really strong presence in Skibbereen and, and the wider West Cork region and seen firsthand, I suppose, the benefit of the Ludgate and what it's doing locally and the benefit it is bringing locally. They've worked on creating this ecosystem within the area underpinned by the first class digital connectivity that supports business and job development. It's, it is attracting and it's retaining talent locally. And we all would agree that this is the key to sustaining rural Ireland. Like the Ludgate, we also uh, have strong, we're strong advocates of the desire to increase digital literacy and children entering STEM education, given the exciting opportunities these offer. And the Ludgate is really to be commended on the excellent work it is doing in this regard. In terms of the agri sector, the sector has enjoyed a relatively good year from a price and weather perspective. And overall, far average farm incomes should be uh, up on what was a good year for the sector in 2020. Having said that, we do appreciate that there are some headwinds on the horizon. So, for example, we can all appreciate the rising input costs, uh, both from a sector perspective, but also personally, um, um, but particularly from the sector with feed, fertilizer, fuel prices all expected to be up significantly. And with this trend likely to continue into 2022, it seems. So in the near term, my first message to farmers today is to encourage them to take action now, review their own individual situation for the next year. And if bank support is required, please do engage with it early with your provider, AIB. Hopefully, if you are an AIB customer, obviously another provider, if that is your bank of choice. Looking out further into the medium and longer term, um, and uh, Grani has already mentioned this, there's no doubt Agri will be impacted by the new CAP strategic plan, which will be introduced in 2023. Uh, significant changes have been proposed under Ireland's next nitrous action plan, and the agri sector has new targets to comply with under the climate action plan. So what seems clear is that one of these elements on their own would have a, the, an impact on the sector. So combined, they're certainly going to have a significant effect on the future shape of Irish agriculture. And putting myself in the shoes of farmers, I guess that these changes, when you put them together, might seem what's somewhat daunting, though I have to say that from my own experience and from my colleagues' experience and from many years of servicing the sector, is that farmers and the agri-sector in general are very resilient to change and the economic cycles, the swings and the roundabouts, uh, probably more so than any other sector, if I'm being honest. And that augurs well, I think, for the future direction here. Uh, what is crystal clear, and I think this narrative is beginning to, 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 to hold sway now, is that farmers want to produce quality, safe, traceable, sustainable food, and they want to do more to, the, to help the environment, reduce carbon emissions and become more carbon efficient. But it's probably needed is technology, support and direction to enable this. And I'm really looking forward to hearing more in this regard from our speaker shortly. So my second message today is to the sector is that in these times of change, I want to take the opportunity to, first of all, reaffirm AIB's position in the agri market. It's a huge part of our business and it will continue to be so in the future. Maybe to give you a sense of that, um, agri is by far our largest SME sector for new lending in our branches outside of Dublin each year. And in Cork alone, it accounts for over 40% of lending to SME customers and probably more so, it is more so in our rural branches uh, where the figures is a lot higher. So Agri is really important to us. It's very, very important to us. And to provide additional options to our customers, we've partnered with the Strategic Banking Corporation of Ireland, the SBCI, to provide two low, low cost finance options for our SME and farming customers in the form of the credit guarantee scheme and the Brexit impact loan scheme, which we believe will continue to support investment in the sector and on Irish farms over the years ahead. On the question of food production and sustainability, we are all aware, I suppose, of the important role Ireland can play to meet these needs. And you might have seen recently that AIB is committed to be the first financial institution to be carbon neutral by 2030. And it's a really key priority for us internally within our organization to make sure that we play our part in the context of the wider agenda, which is a really important agenda for future generations, as we know. 
So before I finish up, I would like to congratulate all involved in organising the event. It's a terrific lineup, and I want to give special mention to Maeve Butley, our branch manager in Skibbereen, for the support she has offered to Grania and the Ludgate team in putting the conference together. Um, I, I must say I'm really looking forward to it. I think it's going to be a fantastic interest and a benefit. So without further delay, I'd like to hand over to our moderator, I think, Ronya, at this stage, uh, Justin McCarthy, who's editor-in-chief exe exe executive of the Irish Farmers Journal. John, thank you very much. Uh, and uh, congratulations to Gráinne and her team down in Ludgate for pulling together another uh, uh, great, what I'm sure will be another great event, and uh, it's a great uh, privilege to be able to be with you here today, Grania, albeit uh, again virtually. Unfortunately, I had uh, looked uh, to, to uh, look forward to heading down to West Cork, but unfortunately, uh, events, I suppose, uh, uh, took a different uh, direction, and we're all here back at a virtual event. But nonetheless, I'm sure we will uh, still have a very engaging uh, and thought-provoking meeting, as uh, as the previous speakers have said, around the issues of climate action, around the issues of uh, common agricultural policy, and indeed the nitrates directive. And I think it, it is fantastic to see that we have uh, Secretary General of the Department of Agriculture, Brendan Gleeson, here to look at that through uh, policy landscape, and also then Harold Kingston uh, from the IFA in relation to discuss that from uh, from the perspective of uh, uh, the, the farming viewpoint. But before we do that, uh, ladies and gentlemen, I am going to, uh, we're just going to play a small introductory and a welcome message from our Minister for Agriculture, Charlie McConnell. -Oak. Good morning, everyone. I'm delighted to be able to join such an august group of speakers at this year's Ludgate Conference. I should single out my own Secretary General, Brendan Gleeson, who will address you later. He's one for the limelight, so I know he'd be disappointed if I didn't draw attention to him like this. The Ludgate movement has been at the forefront of sustainable rural regeneration since its inception in 2016. The past 18 months, nearly two years at this stage, has shown what can be achieved by embracing digital connectivity and by developing and nurturing a digital economy on the back of high-speed broadband. This has been rural Ireland's chance to shine. And the Ludgate movement has been a real blueprint for how such a new and exciting way of living and working can be rolled out. Ludgate originated as an, an initiative which aimed to create a digitally enabled rural society in West Cork in the form of a digital hub, in which innovators can create and expand their businesses in rural Ireland while competing in national and international markets. It has truly revolutionised the local <coughs> rural community, reversing the tide of inevitable immigration of young people and enabling them to stay return or move to a rural environment where opportunities for living and working are now possible. The role of hubs, e-centres and co-working spaces around the country and their importance in driving rural regeneration with a specific focus on digitisation, agriculture and sustainability programmes is critical. The agriculture sector is going through one of the most revolutionary periods in decades or generations. This is not rhetoric, but fact. However, for our sector, like Ludgate, change, evolution and transition is nothing new, as we've always moved to adapt new technologies, pioneer new techniques and target new practices. We're currently working through some of the most important policy decisions in many years. The formation of Ireland's new CAP strategic plan is occurring at the same time as we are carefully plotting our way through the Climate Action Plan as well as the new Nitrates Action Plan. All of these will leave an indelible mark on our sector for many years. These key policy decisions will make a very significant impact on agriculture, but I entirely reject the notion that any of these must be negative or destructive. We will evolve, we will change, we will transition and adapt, but this will be for the better. It is fair to say that our great sector is facing into a very different decade to the one we have just experienced. The last decade was one of volume growth, 
The next decade will be one of sustainable value growth. This is central to the Food Vision 2030 strategy I launched earlier this year. We are a sector that touches off every rural parish in the country, that generates over 14 billion euro in exports, and a sector that supports hundreds of thousands of jobs across the country. Food Vision charts a course of how we can sustainably grow our exports to 21 billion euro by the end of the decade, ensuring that everyone along the supply chain is benefiting. Food Vision is the culmination of almost two years of discussion, consultation, debate and reflection by a wide range of stakeholders, many of whom are here today. It goes without saying that the next cap and Food Vision must marry with our commitments under the Climate Action Plan. The target we negotiated of a 22% to 30% reduction in agricultural emissions by the end of the decade is a challenging but achievable target. It is a target that I fought hard for and is in line with the Programme for Government of recognising the importance of agriculture as well as the unique science behind our sector. It is crucial that we also recognise the positive environmental action engaged in over many years by farmers. Yes, all sectors must play their part and the narrative that agriculture should be singled out for having a greater hill to climb is unfair and wrong. Government policy recognises that every sector, including agriculture, will have to make a real contribution if we are to reach our climate objectives. But the creation of a narrative by some that alienates our farmers is unhelpful. There are so many reasons to be positive about what is in front of us. To conclude, as I said, we are facing into a period of considerable change for our great sector, but we can and should be excited about this change. After all, the agri sector has been one long evolution. The tractor replaced the horse, the combine replaced the trasher. Even when bale silage and wrapping became the new kid in the block in the mid 1980s, this seemed like a monumental change to a lot of farmers then. There were plenty who said it couldn't be done and it can't happen, but it could be done and indeed it did happen. We will change and we will adapt and we will put farming on a fir firm footing with a bright future. Thank you to Ludgate for the invitation and best wishes for the rest of today's proceedings. Thank you very much. Thank you, Minister, for that, what was no doubt a, a very upbeat meeting. And uh, I suppose it is a fantastic segue into my next speaker, uh, as the Minister alluded to, Brendan Gleeson, Secretary General of the Department of Agriculture, who uh, is uh, in severe hunger for the limelight, as the Minister says, uh, always putting himself forward. Brendan, you're going to, uh, you're going to do a, a, a brief six to eight minutes and I appreciate Brendan the, the challenge of trying to deal with these three topics in such a, uh, a tight time frame but we may tease out some of the other aspects in the Q&A uh, which will follow so over to you Brendan for your presentation thank you. Thanks Justin um, I noticed my time for a contribution has contracted from 10 <laughs> minutes to six to eight minutes so you must be desperate to get at me so I'll, I'll try and facilitate you. Uh, so firstly, I want to thank the people in Ludgate, Grania and our team. They've been really hospitable to me over the last two days, actually, because I, I, I worked from here yesterday. Uh, and it's been a fantastic experience. You can see how a facility like this is a real driver of growth in, in a rural area uh, and it's a town like Skibbereen. So it's, it's a fantastic facility. I had asked Justin to come down so I could show him around uh, over the weekend. But uh, he assures me that with a name like Justin McCarthy, he didn't need any lessons from me navigating West Cork, so I suppose that's fair enough. So look, the Irish agri-food sector has a global reach. It's operating in a world where markets, currency fluctuations, international trade relations, climate and environmental pressures, and geopolitical tensions all have an impact on demand and supply. Given the events of the last two years, it's in pretty good shape. Critical supply chains have continued to function. The value of exports to the UK uh, has held up despite Brexit, and commodity prices are strong. Of course, inflationary pressures that are affecting many sectors across the globe are beginning to bite, and there are emerging supply issues with fertilizers, and that's a real concern. But overall, the sector has shown tremendous resilience in the face of Brexit and COVID. 
This is the world which is helping to shape some of the major policy decisions being made at present. Against that background, there are a number of significant policy developments, which in an ideal world, you might choose to sequence differently. But they're with us now, and we have to get on with dealing with them. Setting COVID aside, the issue dominating global discourse are climate and the environment. Citizens across the world are seized with the seriousness of the situation, and the same is true in Ireland. The Climate Action Amendment Act was signed into law on the 23rd of July 2021. It requires net zero greenhouse gas emissions low later than 2050, and a reduction of 51% in cross economy emissions by 2030, compared with the 2018 baseline. Every sector has to contribute. Reductions required range from 62 to 81% for electricity, 42 to 50% for transport, 44 to 50% for buildings, 29 to 41% for industry, and 22 to 30% for agriculture. There are also ambitious separate targets for land use, land use change, and forestry. Cross economy carbon budgets for the period to 2025 and from 2025 to 2030, and an indicative budget for the period to 2035 will shortly be pre presented to the Oireachtas for consideration, and sectoral ceilings will be decided by government sometime next year. Meeting these targets will be incredibly challenging. It will require the deployment of the full suite of technologies and management practices available and the development of new, of new and emerging technologies. But it will have to be done. The sector will need to reduce chemical nitrogen inputs, improve animal breeding and feeding, reduce the age of, age of slaughter and increase the area farmed organically. The 2021 Climate Action Plan also sets out ambition under the land use sector with a focus on reducing the management intensity of farmed organic soils, increased tree planting and measures to build carbon in our soils. The combined efforts of the state, farmers and industry players will be needed. Industry players can encourage behavioural change at farm level. We've already seen some great initiatives such as milk processors paying a milk price bonus for farmers that adopt certain biodiversity initiatives on their farms. This is the type of forward thinking in the agri-food sector that Ireland needs, with all actors across the food chain contributing in a meaningful way to their environmental responsibilities. Research and innovation will play an ever more important role over this decade. We already have a number of impressive examples of innovation in the agri-food sector. Farmers and industry partners who provide data on, from their own farms are making full use of the integrated data from ICBF in their breeding and farm management decisions. Commercial companies are leveraging research by Chagask and UCD to inform the development of new products and advice on management strategies to optimize the benefits of things like multi-species swords on farms across Ireland. Here in West Cork, a farmer-led small-scale biorefinery demonstrated the fractionation of grass into a variety of new products for pig feed, sugars fit for human consumption, and bio-based fertilizer alongside cattle feed, demonstrating improved protein efficiency, value and sustainability from Irish grasslands while maintaining milk quality and yield. So there is fantastic work going on in this sector. In future, there will need to be a continued orientation of research budgets into climate smart agriculture. In parallel, a new common agricultural policy has just been signed off in the European Parliament. Member states must now submit cap strategic plans to the EU Commission by year end if payments to farmers are to be made in 2023. Ireland's cap budget, which was in real danger back in 2018 because of the UK's departure from the EU, has been protected. 10.75 billion euro has been provided in current prices in the period 2021 to 27 compared to 10.68 billion in the previous seven years. And there's been a substantial increase in national funding in Ireland, with more than a billion extra provided in the period 2021 to 27, bringing the co-funding rate from 47% in the 2014 to 2020 period to 60% in the period 2021 to 2027. Like the last cap, the new policy continues with the redistribution of payments. Through a process called convergence, every farmer's payment per hectare will be brought to at least 85% of the average by 2026. In addition, 10% of payments will be diverted to the first 30 hectares in order to support small to medium-sized farmers. Payments will be capped at 66,000 euro per, per applicant, and the amount ring fenced for young farmers will be increased by 50%, from 2% of the envelope to 3% of the envelope. Inevitably, proposals to redistribute payments can be controversial and divisive, depending on what side of the line you're on. They were, however, an absolutely central pillar of the proposals published by the Commission in 2018, 
and attracted widespread support in the Council and the European Parliament. There's a substantially increased environmental ambition with a new green architecture. This was absolutely necessary to protect the budget. Apart from an increase in baseline conditions attached to the basic income support, member states must set aside a minimum of 25% of Pillar 1 funds for eco schemes. This is approximately 297 million euro per annum. The objective is to offer farmers a choice of simple practical measures they can apply on their farms in any given year. For example, measures supporting extensive livestock production or reducing chemical nitrogen use will help to reduce emissions from the sector. And there's a substantially strengthened pillar two with a range of environmental options, including a new agri-environmental scheme with more than 100 million extra in funding per annum. There's a massive increase in ambition for the organic farming with 256 million available over five years. And schemes such as the Suckler Carbon Efficiency Programme and the Sheep Welfare Scheme also target emissions efficiency through better breeding and improved animal health and welfare while underpinning the economic sustainability of these important sectors. Farming plays an important role in the Irish economy and landscape. Agricultural activity covers about 60% of land area. Water quality in our rivers, lakes and groundwater is relatively good, but has been deteriorating. We have to change that direction of travel. Agriculture has had an impact, but it also has a very important role in reversing that decline. And some of the issues are regional in nature. The nitrates regulations give effect to nitrates action program for the protection of waters against pollution caused by agricultural sources. The Department of Housing, Planning and Heritage is the lead department for those regulations. And my department is working closely with that department on the review of the nit nitrates action program at present. This review will help to stabilize and improve water quality and also seeks co-benefits for climate, air and biodiversity. And layered on top of that is a derogation that allows farmers to farm in a more intensive way, but that necessarily comes with additional measures and controls guided by the science configured to protect water quality. We're also working on more targeted measures in collaboration with state agencies and industry. The department and industry have pioneered the joint industry government ASAP scheme, providing targeted advice free of charge to farmers. This collaborative approach builds strong relationships with farmers with interim results showing environmental improvements in targeted areas. We're also working closely with the EPA to review water quality monitoring, water quality trends, and to investigate the pressures from nutrient, pesticides, and sediment losses. We're also modeling the impact of measures to reduce nutrient loss losses to the environment. All of these measures are a critical element in building a defensible case for the renewal of the nitrates derogation which is so critically important for the dairy sector in particular. I've touched on many of the issues relevant to the future of farming, but I want to remind people that there is a vision for its future, Food Vision 2030, developed through collaboration between stakeholders. From a public consultation in the summer of 2019, followed by an open policy debate in the Aviva Stadium, and the establishment of a 32-person stakeholder committee under the chairmanship of Tom Arnold, an enormous amount of effort went into developing a vision for the development of the sector that aligns with the direction of travel in climate and cap reform policy. Food Vision identifies 22 goals grouped into four high level missions for the sector to work towards. They are a climate smart, environmental, sustainable agri food sector, viable and resilient primary producers with enhanced well being food that is safe, nutritious and appealing, trusted and valued at home and abroad, and an innovative, competitive and resilient agri-food sector driven by technology and talent. So I want to commend all of those who participated in that exercise uh, and finish with a direct quote from their document. And this is what it says. Ireland will become a world leader in sustainable food systems over the next decade. This should deliver significant benefits for the Irish agri-food sector itself, for Irish society and the environment. In demonstrating the Irish agri-food sector meets the highest standards of sustainability, economic, environmental and social, this should also provide the basis for future competitive advantage for the sector. By adopting an integrated food systems approach, Ireland will seek to become a global leader of innovation for, the, for sustainable food and agriculture systems producing safe, nutritious, and high value food that tastes great while protecting and enhancing our natural and cultural resources 
and contributing to viable rural and coastal communities and the national economy. So this is the strong and positive vision developed by the sector for itself. And it's something I think that everybody can get behind. It avoid, avoids the false binary of environment versus farming, but rather recognizes the strong synergies between the two. And that's the way it has to be. It recognizes the linkage between the branding of Irish food in international markets and strong environmental performance. And it recognizes the absolutely unbreakable link between the agri-food sector and a vibrant rural economy and community. So I can see that Justin is waiting to get at me. So I think that's probably a good place to, to end my talk. So thanks for your attention, everybody. Thank you for that, Brendan, and, and, and very stimulating. And I suppose, Brendan, if I could merge, I suppose, the minister's upbeat opening address with, I suppose, your upbeat uh, outlook and, and, and I suppose for the sector. And I've attended a number of farmers' meetings in person, and I'd be interested in Harold's views on this after. There's no, I don't see and sense that same optimism at farm level. I, I, I actually probably like never before see a, a level of fear uh, at farm level to, towards the future, especially, as you mentioned, those cohort of farmers that see their critical cap payments that make up a large part of their income being eroded uh, through, through the, the convergence. But I just want to pick up, you, you talk about the food vision, you talk about sustainable food systems, and at the core of sustainable food systems are, is economic sustainability at farm level. I just want to challenge it. Where do you see, because everything we talked about, uh, or a lot of what's been talked about in terms of environmental, is going to either reduce output at farm level or increase costs at farm level. And if we don't get that value add that you talk about, that today we see our beef prices, uh, Brendan, lower than the Polish beef price. So we're coming a long way in terms of actually delivering value add back to the farmer. If we don't get that value add, which we haven't been shown to be very good at, let's, let's, be, let's be clear, where is farmers' income, or what policy landscape are we going to see that protects farmers' income? Well, Justin, we, we have to work in the real world, and we have to work within within the framework we're given. And the, the truth is that we we have done a, a really remarkable job, I think, at national level in protecting the Irish Common Agricultural Policy uh, budget. And we've also done a very good job at marketing Irish food abroad. Uh, on the basis of a clean green image, the origin green image. And that's the framework within which we have to work. Now, nobody can guarantee agricultural prices. It's just not possible. But what you can do is try and ensure that Irish produce ends up on shelves in the highest value markets. And we have been successful at that, I think. So I think you have to work with a combination of public supports. And the government has done that through the provision of substantial additional funding for CAP. People will always argue about whether that's adequate or not, but I, but I think the programme for government commitment ha has been met. Uh, and through the combination of that and the work we do in international markets and the work done by farmers themselves uh, to work within the framework they're given and keep costs as low as possible. And I think there are, um, you know, grounds for optimism. I mean, I, I was very struck by the, the KPMG report that you, that you commissioned, uh, uh, Justin, and I thought there was something worthy of a headline in it, actually, that maybe didn't get the headline, which was that you could actually, with an 18% with reduction in emissions, that dairy farm incomes would increase. So I think, look, we have to work uh, within the framework we're given. Uh, and I think farmers are up for the challenge and they can do it. And CAP is a unique kind of a policy. It transforms itself every seven years. And that means the department has to transform itself in every, every seven years. And farmers have to transform them sells every seven years. So, you know, I mean, there was a time when the cap was focused on, on uh, market supports and intervention. We had butter and, and, and beef mountains. I'm not sure that kind of a system would survive first contact with society as it stands now. And equally, society as it stands now pl places a high premium on the environment and climate change. And we have to get on board that. We have been on board that ship before any other sector, actually. But we're faced with a kind of a, a, a new urgency now and we have to deal with what's in front of us. But Brendan, have you seen evidence that society is prepared to pay for sustainability and, envir and, and environmental dividends? They're, they may be prepared to talk about it and look for it, but whenever the, the decision comes at the consumer uh, on, on the retail shelf, is there a willingness to pay for it? Because at the end of the day, you're moving huge amounts of direct supports away from protecting food producers in the cap towards environmental payments. The cap was set up to allow food to be produced 
effectively in some cases below the cost of production. Uh, you're moving that support away in this cap, not you, but policy is moving that support away and putting it towards environmental. Where does that sit? Are, 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 have we, has anybody, has, or has any politician broached the subject that this is going to, sustainable food is going to cost more? Yeah, well, just, I mean, I suppose, uh, Justin, I, I think what you presented there is one of these false binaries that I was talking about, you know, so is cap and agri food policy, uh, policy or is it an environmental policy? And the reality is it has evolved over time. And you, you ask a very interesting question, I think, uh, which is, are people willing to pay for, for climate action? And there was an interesting Irish Times Ipsos poll a number of weeks ago that suggested that people were very much in favour of climate action, but very reluctant to pay for it. So look, I, I can't answer the, the, the question about whether people, I mean, my own view is that one of the things that, I mean, it's, it's basic economics, supply and demand determine what people are willing to pay for food. So governments can't control, control that, but they can control, I suppose, the perspective of consumers in relation to product from Ireland. And I think... You know, the best we can do is make sure that Irish food ends up on the shelves where the most is paid. So we cannot compete on commodity markets with the Brazilians, for example. We couldn't compete, I think, if all our beef was going into manufacturing. I, I, I don't think we could do that. Uh, so I think we do have to continue with this effort to, uh, to attract the, the people who buy at the highest price. We do have to continue to sell into the UK market because that's a high price market. It's on our doorsteps. Uh, and actually, tomorrow we're engaged in a, in a function with Borbia to engage with some of the big retailers in the UK uh, to to kind of reinforce our commitment to the UK market. Brendan, you mentioned the KPMG report, and you're quite right. I would would be the first to concur with you. An 18% reduction in the full implementation of all the MAC measures did show for a marginal increase in dairy farm profits and more or less uh, a, a break even uh, for beef. But when we that that is. The challenge of doing that and implementing all of that technology can't be overlooked as well. Uh, but also, we can't overlook the fact that when we go beyond that 18%, and hopefully new technologies will emerge, but for example, the 22% uh, or to 30% range is a billion to a 4 billion euro hit uh, to, to, uh, to economic activity in rural towns and villages, according to KPMG. Yet, we basically see CAP being repurposed uh, to support farmers in their climate transition. There is no new money. Is that, is, is, is that fair? Uh, well, I mean, I don't agree that there's no new money, you know. So we, we've had a discussion about this before, um, uh, Justin, as well, about whether CAP is the instrument. So there's lots of new money. Now, I, I, I understand that, that people and advocates for, for agriculture will always say, well, there isn't enough of it. And that's, that's fair enough. <laughs> So well, tell well, us where the new money is, Brendan. Where yeah, is this new money? Yeah, so there's, a, there's an extra billion euro in, in carbon taxes gone into, uh, gone into farming from, from, from in the seven years to 2027. And there'll be, if the programme for government commitment is met, there'll be an extra half a billion in carbon taxes added after that between 28 and 30. Uh, Brendan, and that's, that's a and, drop uh, in the ocean. That's a drop in the ocean to what the KPMG report showed to be the economic impact. Yeah, but the economic impact depends on, on, the, on the outcome and the target. Uh, so, so, I mean, what we have is a roadmap uh, part of the way to 22%. We have developing technologies, some of which will be on the market as early as next year. Uh, and then we have work going on in new technology. So we don't have all of the answers yet, but there has been a significant additional financial commitment from government, uh, an enormous financial commitment. And, and then, Justin... Then we're into the argument about whether that's enough or not, and, and that's beyond my pay grade. But but I think it is certainly it's certainly not true to suggest that additional resources haven't been provided on top of the cap and on top of the normal co-funding rate that we have. So over the last period, we had a co-funding rate of forty-seven percent. That forty-seven percent has been matched, and then it's been increased to sixty percent through the addition of carbon tax over the next seven but years. If you take the carbon tax out, Brendan, it's a two percent increase in the level of co-financing. Is that correct? But in, in, in a way, Justin, I don't really understand the, 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 the question in a way. So, so, I mean, additional funding has been provided. So I think the you mechanism, understand the, it okay, Brendan. The, 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 you don't, it's not your misunderstanding no, of the question. No, no, but, but, but the mechanism for supporting farmers is the common agricultural policy. And therefore, it's a logical mechanism 
for adding uh, funding in from the carbon tax. Now, you could decide, well, we won't do it that way. We'll take the carbon tax away from, 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 from the common agricultural policy and we'll support a suite of measures separately. I don't think that would make a huge amount of sense. So the, the fact is that there's been an enormous addition to the funding uh, for common agricultural policy over the next seven years. There'll be another addition between 28 and 30, another half a billion in carbon tax if the programme for government commitment is to be met. But look, I, I, I absolutely appreciate that, Justin, that as an advocate for the sector, uh, that you'll say, well, that's not enough. Uh, that's fair enough. Brendan, I want to just, and I move on quick, because I do want to come to nitrates before we go, and maybe from a different angle than you were expecting. Uh, but Brexit Adjustment Reserve Fund, you talked about the importance yeah. of the UK market. You talked about the importance of, uh, particularly for our beef and dairy sectors. We see it being internationalized, trade deals done with Australia, trade deals done with New Zealand, possibly US and, and South America. There's a billion euro fund. The only money that's been allocated is 77 million euros to meat processors and farmers have been excluded. Why is that? Why are farmers not? Why are farmers being silenced in terms of this Brexit adjustment reserves? Uh, well, that's not the only money that's been allocated. So there's a very substantial amount of money allocated for fishing, and there's an immediate hit to the fishing sector. I'm sure there might be people around the table with an involvement in the fishing sector. So they've lost 15% of their quotas, and, the, and macro fishermen have lost 25% of their quotas, which is an immediate hit. So the truth is that with the Brexit adjustment reserve, you're faced with a regulatory framework that says you can support sectors that have had an impact, an existing previous impact, a demonstrable imp impact from, from Brexit. So look, the, the process of reflection on the Brexit Adjustment Reserve, Reserve is not concluded. Uh, so we are reflecting on how we might best use it. Um, but it's, you know, the truth is that uh, over the last two years, certainly there isn't a demonstrable impact on prices from, from Brexit. Prices have held up extraordinarily well, and I'm knocking around in, in this job or uh, around this job for quite a while, and, and it's, I, I'm not sure I can remember a time when prices were, were as good as they are. Now, you've cited Polish prices, Irish prices lower than po Polish prices, and fair enough, it's one of these things where the relativ relativities will al always provide uh, grounds for argument. But look, the, pro the process of reflection on Brexit Adjustment Reserve is not concluded. But as Secretary General of the Department of Ag, what have you been asked for from the farm organisations in relation to support through the Brexit Adjustment Reserve Fund? What 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 are the demands being placed on you? Well, I don't think we've had specific proposals from farm organisations. So, I mean, uh, I mean about about the uh, about the, the the kind of expenditure we. But but I mean, I, I wouldn't expect that, uh, Justin. So look, as I say, there's a process of reflection, reflection going on about how we can best use the reserve. Uh, and if there's a mechanism there for supporting farmers, then of course we'll use it. But we'll have to come up with something that is consistent with the regulatory framework. You can't make Brenda, it up. I'm going to I'm going to finish on on nitrates, and again because this is something you might be surprised that I pick up from a lot of farmers nowadays. There are so many farmers out there that are proud of how they operate their farms to the environmental standards to which they operate, and then they see mispractices or or abuse of those regulations happening in places, and suddenly the issue of water quality becomes everybody's problem where the source may be one person's wrongdoing. Is the Department of Agriculture doing enough to fully implement the current regulations around the Nitrates Action Plan and ensure that there's compliance? That to me is, is a real anger among a lot of farmers in relation to this, that they're doing the right thing, a small minority aren't, and everybody's getting tired with the one brush. Well, I think that's a really interesting question. And the way you've asked it is very interesting. And I know that farm bodies, um, excuse me, I'll have to, forgive me. That's probably my wife ringing me, wondering where I am. That's the minister realising you've just committed another billion euros to the cap fund. I, I, uh, I, I, don't, I, don't think, I don't think I did that, Justin. No, but, but it's interesting the way you've asked that question. And, and I think you're, you're absolutely right. Um, you know, I, I mean, I, there are practices out there by a minority that have to become as unacceptable as smoking in people's houses, or there has to be a kind of a fundamental uh, cultural change. I know the farm bodies have been talking about this recently, and I think that's really, really important, uh, that this just has to be unacceptable. Uh, I mean, from, the, uh, from the, uh, the control point of view, I suppose the department's function here is to take cross-compliance reports from, from, the, uh, from the local authorities, um, but we do, we do need a more joined up control function, I think, between the department and, and the local authorities. So I think it is, it is really important that we do that. It doesn't obviate the need for baseline conditions for all farmers. 
or for increased conditionality for farmers availing of the derogation, because I think we, we need to have that baseline. But I do think it's doing immense, the actions of a small few are doing immense reputational damage to the sector, and that has to be unacceptable to everybody. And I'm quite sure it is to, to the majority of the people uh, listening here today. Brendan, look, thank you very much. Uh, you and I could probably stay on some of those funding topics for, for the whole two hours, but it would be unfair on, on the other speakers and probably the, the viewers as well. Brendan, look, thank, thank you very, very much for your time. I know I, I speak on behalf of all, all the, uh, the participants here this morning. Uh, a very informative debate and, and great to have somebody in your position uh, contributing to the, to the seminar here this morning. Thank you very much for your time. Thank, thanks, everyone. Thanks for your attention. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm, I'm very interested now to, to go on. I think it's a, a perfect segue to, to somebody that certainly needs no introduction in West Cork uh, and probably anybody uh, at, the, at the following national politics, uh, uh, Harold Kingston needs no introduction too. So Harold, uh, you, have a, you have a presentation for us in the same format as a few questions and answers. And I'd be very keen to get some of your views on uh, some of the comments there by uh, by Brendan Gleeson. Apparently, you have so much money, you don't know what to do with it, Harold, and you should be delighted with this uh, cap reform. And I know, Brendan, I'm paraphrasing you there. But, uh, Har Harold, over to you. OK, thanks, thanks, Justin. I, I, I presume uh, you, can, you can see the Yeah, we can, see your, we can see your slides, uh, Harold. Fantastic, fantastic. OK, the technology is working in West Cork today. Um, so. Listen, thank, thank you for, 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 for that introduction. Um, and, and I was interested in listening to Brendan and we'll see, we'll see where this goes now with this presentation. I've, I've a fair few slides to get through. I'm going to do this in, in, in the form of a rant. So, so buckle up and we'll see, we'll see how we go. Um, and hopefully all the technology works. So first thing, and, and, and I think your, your last question there on nitrates was very important as well. And, and I think the first thing we have to do on, on anything is own the problem. Uh, and and look, the, that's the, the the reason for this slide as such is first of all, yes, there is a situation where agriculture is the is is the standout uh, in terms of when you count the emissions, and, and I'm going to focus primarily on 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 the climate side of it for for this. But the other thing to be mindful of is is agriculture didn't actually get affected by COVID. Um, two sectors that did get affected by, by COVID in the 2020 figures was that households figures went up by 9% because we were all at home. Uh, transport dropped by 15.7% um, because of the fact that there was less transport. The key thing there is that that, that drop in transport has suddenly bounced back again. And it, it just highlights the, the level uh, of, of challenge that's there in the other sectors. It's not just agriculture in terms of dealing with this. Where's this problem coming from in agriculture in terms of the counting? Um, and, and look, it, it's coming from cows and fertilizer, basically. Look, that's that's the bottom line. It, it's, a, it's looking at methane, it's looking at nitrous oxide. That's why so much of a focus is on that. So what is the government legally committed to, or legally committed us to, whichever way you want to put it? This is a positive, okay? Um, you talked about upbeat, Justin. Let's try and keep this upbeat for a start. So it's positive because when we have a deadline, when we have commitments, that positive attracts funding and that uh, attracts scientific interest. Think about COVID-19 and COVID and vaccines. Suddenly there was a challenge, so the scientific community came on board, funding came on board, and, and we, we targeted getting that challenge. The difficulty here is that the plan that we see in front of us at the moment, as you have pointed out, Justin, in the um, in, in your, your KPMG report as well, <clears throat> you know, there's the plan to get it so far, um, but right now we don't know how we're going to get to, to, to the rest of it. So, look, I presume most people will have seen the, the, the Chagas Mac curve. Anything below that line is a positive, anything above that line is a cost for farming. Animal breeding, anything to do with animal health is a major positive from, from all sides. Uh, and, and, and it is a big deliver on, on reducing our, our greenhouse gases as well. Likewise, if you see in the middle of, of the MAC curve there, fertilizer type. Now, fertilizer price has gone through the roof, but um, in terms of, of fertilizer type, the use of, of protected ureas and so on, if we can get it for next year, um, it does actually, it, it costs a bit more, but it does actually deliver quite substantially. The difficulty with this is in, in terms of what we're legally required to do is that it's only whatever's <clears throat> actually inside those boxes that we can actually count. And that's a major difficulty now. So that's only 2 million tons of, of the 5 million tons that we need to deliver for to, to hit that 22% of, of, of a reduction. 
And then we always hear, you know, well, <clears throat> farming is the only sector that can actually sequester carbon as well. Where has that gone? That has gone into this Lulu CF box. And, and what I can deliver as a, as a grassland farmer is the little box on the left-hand side of that box. So what, what's currently counted and what I can deliver on sequestration is actually very, very small. The big thing that can be delivered is forestry, and we know where forestry is going at the moment. At the moment, IFA and, and myself, we don't actually, we, we couldn't in, in our conscience recommend to any farmer to go planting forestry because you don't know you can harvest it. So it, there's a major difficulty there in, in, in terms of dealing with that. And this is very confusing for farmers because, you know, we, we, we heard at, at the start of it about a bank that's going to be carbon neutral. We can buy carbon neutral petrol. We can we can offset by paying an extra fiver if we go on a shopping trip to New York as opposed to Skibbereen. We, we can we can offset our emissions. And meanwhile, we have the Minister for, for Environment telling us that our land is, is, is a carbon source. And our land is a carbon source because the counting mechanisms that are there at the moment to do with, with the peat soils. Yes, we can we can deliver an off lot, but right now it's not actually being counted. Um, this conference that he was speaking at was talking about mixed wars that's supposed to be another silver bullet. I'm not sure that, it, that it's ready to be a silver bullet just yet. Also in that conference, um, he, he mentioned about water quality being shot. Our water quality isn't, isn't shot. That doesn't really help our farmer confidence in, in, the, in the government to hear, hear that kind of a statement coming out. Austria is better than us in, in the European context. And of course they are. The water's coming down off mountains before it reaches any, any population. It's a completely different setup to, 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 to everywhere else. And, and we're, we're virtually on a par with that. So what are other people saying about us? So if you look at you now Irish Wildlife Trust, I suppose, yeah, look, this is, this is standard anti-agriculture, anti-farmer anti hype, and I suppose anti-IFA hype as well, as Brendan will... will, will um, Will, will tell us as well, there was a bit of a discussion as to where we, whether we should set this minimum level of uh, unproductive area, as it's called in the CAP. And it was a bit of a discussion as to whether it was going to be 5% or 4%. It was set at 4%. And all of a sudden, the uh, papers was all this thing about, oh, there's a 20% reduction. Farmers want to do 20% less uh, biodiversity. The reality is that that extra biodiversity is going to come in farmers of the, of the eco schemes. It's coming. But that, that's the kind of anti-agriculture narrative that's out there. If you look at the middle one, uh, I'm sorry, I'm big into social media. Um, you know, I'm actually incredibly excited about what's happening on, on, on seaweeds and so on. The, the, the testing that's going on with the asparagus offices there in, in Bantry, um, really exciting what we can deliver. And yet you have Lynn McGough, sorry, Dr. Lynn McGough from Ontashka, uh, who are uh, campaigning to try and stop a cheese plant in, for, for Danbia at the moment, telling us that it's a get out of jail. Delivering climate emissions is not a get out of jail. Obviously, it seems to be a case or oh, reduction of animals is the only way that we can do this. And that seems to be a narrative that's out there uh, among a lot of environmentalists. I want to read that, that paragraph that's there. Um, on, on the right hand side then in, in the journal.ie, that's the other journal, not the, not the very well known journal, Justin, um, where the, the paragraph is saying that the number of cows should, um, shouldn't be reduced, but they should be reduced as, as form of, of policy rather than a direct cut in animal numbers. The reason why that paragraph is important is that that paragraph is from Peter Thorne of Minute University. Uh, and Peter Thorne happens to be on the Climate Action uh, sorry, Climate Change Advisory Council, along with Sinead O'Brien, who retweeted the tweet on the left. These are the people who are actually advising government. And I, and that's why I am incredibly worried about the current CAP and the strategic plans that the whole thing is focused on, on reducing numbers, whether you can call it by stealth, whether it's call it by back door, that's what's happening. And that's what nitrates is putting extra costs on farmers as well. And that's where I'm worried that the, the extra emission reductions are gonna come from is by reducing the activity uh, uh, instead. And when, when I called out these scientists, I end up getting uh, slated on, on the Irish Examiner of all places um, for, for, for apparently it's, a, it's not a good look for a farmer to, to question a, a scientist. No, I suppose to be called out by the Phoenix is probably a feather in the cap as such um, and, and, and so on, string to the bow, whatever way you want to put it, feather in the cap, I suppose, uh, when, when you talk about foul emissions. But look, that's that's the reality is, is that, you know, apparently we as farmers were not supposed to question the experts. And who are these experts? Now, the, the experts range from, from scientists to Karen on Facebook. 
uh, and and some of those scientists might be experts in in energy suddenly knowing all about stocking rates and global food markets as well um, and meanwhile there i am in the middle of the farmer um, the person who's actually supposed to implement this policy and i know i'm not supposed to question the, the the policy makers and i'm not supposed to question the scientists the reality is as a lobbyist i am uh, and as a farmer i am going to question that science i'm going to question all all these policies because i'm the one at the end of the day who has to implement it and the final slide yeah look the spotlight is on farming and rightly so in you no know, in terms of what we can deliver and what we have to deliver the positives are that yes with deadlines and with targets it does attract the scientific funding it does attract the the research um the negative if you look at the the forestry debacle as i call it I'd question, is government really serious about delivering uh, the, the emission reductions through science uh, and through mitigation? Or is it a case that there's going to be the easy cop-out and, and reduce activity in, instead? And Brendan Gleeson mentioned about the programme for government delivering. The reality is that carbon tax was, was in the programme for government in order to deliver um, for, for climate action. Instead, it is being used as part of the co-financing uh, instead of being in extra to the coal financing. And meanwhile, in the middle of that picture, you see that cow grazing away. The reality here as well is that cow is working away. Farmers are working away. Um, the, the website at the bottom there, smartfarming.ie, I was incredibly proud to be part of that uh, uh, when, when I was the environment chair in, in IFA. It is possible working together to actually deliver better incomes for farmers, deliver on climate action. It is incredibly exciting to be involved in farming at the moment. You're going to hear some of the science there later on in the conference from, from Chinook. Incredibly uh, exciting what's happening in the signpost program as well. But incredibly frustrating that an awful lot of that good work currently cannot actually be counted against our, our legal obligations. Um, there's no plan and the time is ticking. Thank you. Thanks for that, Harold. Uh, certainly very thought provoking. Harold, I just want to pick you up, and it's maybe slightly off topic, but you just triggered my my mind on it when you were uh, on one of the references you made to environmentalists and then becoming experts with an environmental background, becoming experts on global food production, nutrition, mm -hmm. and whatnot. Do you sometimes get the sense that the environment is almost a cover up for a number of people that actually are, are have a deep rooted belief around animal agriculture more so than the environment, that the environment is a vehicle of which to propagate those views? Well, you should mention that. Yeah. Um, look, I'm, I'm not into conspiracies normally, but in this one I am um, because look, the, the, there is there is a situation and Look, I I tr I, tr I trained um, as as a cool planet champion in order to be actually able to put um, climate um, change and climate action into into English for for people and so on. And I I can see actually people who are using and and misusing what we have to do on climate for their own ideological purposes as well. Um, it's a small number, but it's a vocal number, and it is causing problems to us as farmers um, when we see that you know, um, or go vegan world posters or, or whatever, um, where, where we're being told that the, the way to solve um, the climate problems uh, is, is, to, is to stop eating meat or, or you know, go, go in and, and, and um, in, invest in technology in Silicon Valley instead in order to, to produce our meat in, in the form of, of tablets or whatever. And, you know, look, that's, that's, that's not where, where we should be going. It, it's, it's doing a disservice to those of us who actually want to do climate action. Harold, you, listening to you, and I, I just think in listening to your presentation, like if we could get the Harold Kingston narrative out to more and more consumers, more and more people, your engagement in it to the extent to which you're taking it serious. But we feel, we feel that, and I'm not casting this a question to the IFA I, I, as an industry as, as mm. there's farmers have been effectively fighting this battle on their own to an extent. But as, as and, and, and struggling to do it, where where do we need to go as an industry now at communicating the extent to which agriculture owns, accepts that it owns that problem of of, of, of emissions and its percentage of emissions, but also getting the message out that it's up for this challenge. It needs support. It needs proper policy framework. But there's a willingness among farmers to actually take on this battle. 
Well, one of the things I did recently was drive a tractor to Dublin as part of a protest. But, but um, besides that, yeah, look, look, an awful lot of the problem, and and in fairness, a lot of the um, the general media actually in the last month or so um, has actually cottoned on to this thing that you know farmers are actually up for this challenge, um, and 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 we do realise the, the the issues that are out there, um, and whether whether we're going to you know, look, the chances of being paid extra for food are, are, are minimal. Yes, I take it. What, what Brendan is saying there is quite right in terms of board B uh, uh, trying to get us into the highest price markets and so on. But if you do any survey of, of consumers going into a supermarket, they'll, they'll tell you they're looking for sustainability, they're looking for traceability, they're looking for X, Y, Z, um, and would check what, the, what they bought when they came out and if they bought the special offer. And that's that's the reality of, of you know, there's there's no guarantee that we're going to be, um, you know, prices are good this year, um, definitely, but there's no guarantee on that one. The one thing that we do need is that we need proper support on on for the research as much as anything. Um, and and then actually the recognition for what that research is going to deliver for us. Getting the public on side, I think we, we, we you know, some, some of the stuff that came out of COP26 actually now as well, um, actually highlighted for people the issue of fossil fuels. Um, because seeing what, um, and look, we always knew there was going to be difficulty with, with, with India in particular in terms of delivering on that. You know, and and the sudden change at the very end, where where you know it was it was um, pushing out the 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 coal um, thing to, um, you know, it, it 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 highlighted where where the power and so on of of the fossil fuel lobby. Um, I think the other the other side as well is this this power of one concept. Um, the reality on on delivering for climate, like delivering for water quality, you can do an awful lot yourself. Whereas if, if, if you're looking at, at the climate thing, it, it really does come down to policy um, because no matter how much you want to do um, with, with reducing your footprint, if, if the policy isn't there to encourage you to buy an electric car over a diesel car or whatever, then you know, you're, you're, you're up against this straight away. Uh, and, I, and the same with, with retrofitting houses and everything. So I think people are, are realizing now that an awful lot of the the pushback on food and the pushback on, on farming is actually trying to distract from the other 65% of, of the emissions that, that are being produced in this country. You, you mentioned car, you mentioned diesel there, Harold, and, and mm -hmm. it's a nice segue on to, to our next speaker, but just want to touch, and, and we touched on this yesterday, how does it feel for a farmer to be able to walk onto the forecourt of a petrol station and buy petrol mm -hmm. that's claiming to be carbon neutral and you as a mm. farmer with the asset, the only asset that can actually remove carbon dioxide from the environment, mm -hmm. and you get no credit for that. And yet we can market carbon neutral petrol. It's it's the power of advertising. And and like look, I I, I and and I've got this from the Department of Agriculture staff as well, not from Brendan directly, but but from 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 other people within um within government and so on, that farmers should be looking at um the carbon sequestration and carbon farming as an income source and not to be as worried about the food production side of it. I'm actually very worried that we could actually end up um, on two things. One, one is selling the family silver because if, 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 we, if we trade our carbon credits ahead of the, the point where we're allowed to actually offset them against uh, our food production, are we going to be in difficulty then in a number of years time where we have to reduce our stock because we don't, don't have anything to offset the emissions against? The second part, as an environmentalist, I have a serious difficulty in allowing my farm to be used by somebody who owns a private jet and, and wants to fly to their holiday home in Malibu or wherever. So I, 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 you know, as a farmer, I need to know that I am going to be able to continue to produce food. And as an environmentalist, I'm incredibly worried that that's, that's I'm going to be used uh, in, in order to um, deliver on somebody's conscience because they can afford it. That was actually picked up in an Oxfam report recently that did a calculation that if all the net zero commitments from companies, from uh, carbon emitters, 
was uh, were delivered on it would require 1.6 billion hectares of land we have 1.5 billion hectares of land in food production uh, yeah. so that that shows the anomaly that Harold thank you very much uh, for for your contributions today I, and I think it, it really for an event like this it really is excellent to have farmers like yourself that come on to these events and I, I suppose present the challenges, but also demonstrate such an ability and a willingness uh, to, to meet those challenges and rightly ask for a proper policy framework to, to help you to do that. So well done on that. And I think the, the end of our presentation, ladies and gentlemen, our discussion with Harold leads on very well uh, to somebody that has been intricately involved in this whole area of carbon sequestration. Uh, through his research work up on uh, in uh, in AFPI uh, in Northern Ireland, Dario Fernando. Dario, uh, you're going to give us a presentation now on exactly what Harold and, and Harold's frustration there uh, around not getting recognition for his ability of his soils to carbon uh, or sequester carbon. So over to you, Dario. Thank you. Um, Justin, thank you very much, and thanks actually to Lotgate for my for the invitation today. I've been really enjoying this event. It's very very interesting, and it goes it goes behind science, and it's it's kind of complicated. Um, anyway, so my my goal in the next fifteen minutes is to highlight um, again the importance of soils in um, acting as terrestrial sinks of atmospheric CO two. Carbon sequestration in soils can help reducing the carbon footprint of um, agriculture, but in general can also improve soil health. I think um, we still have to face two key challenges. Uh, one is about how to accurately measure changes in carbon stocks in soils across agroecosystems. And the other one is how do we manage these um, carbon stocks in a way that they are resilient um, in, uh, in the face of um, climate change, environmental change. And um, actually, I think the, the bottom right um, picture in this first slide, it does probably summarize well these two key challenges. So the first one is about measuring. And if you see actually that measuring carbon, it might require digging deep. It requires taking different soil samples across different fields and also across many years. Um, on the other side, um, land use management is also very important. I mean, if you compare um, the left side of this picture, which shows um, basically you can see there are like more dense and deeper rooting systems associated with this perennial wheatgrass and it's very likely that that kind of system is going to contribute to release more carbon in the soil and therefore probably has got a higher carbon sequestration potential of, um, com in comparison with the um, shallow wheat crop system on the right side of this picture, which is associated with um, shallow and actually less dense rooting systems. So just to show you actually the importance of roots and the importance of land use management in relation to carbon sequestration potential. Um, this one is just to remind what um, or how carbon sequestration works. And it basically, it starts from plant's ability to absorb and fix CO2 from the atmosphere, produce biomass in leaves, shoots, and roots. And it is this um, plant biomass, um, including root mass, but also exudation from um, rooting systems, which contribute then to release carbon into the soil, which then interact with microbial communities, which then at the end produces some organo mineral fractions, aggregates in the soil, which can store carbon for a long time. So that's why we call it um, carbon sequestration. Um, and in, in relation to carbon sequestration, um, in my talk today, it's basically focused on um, grasslands because grassland ecosystems um, have a significant land cover, especially across the UK and the Republic of Ireland, and also are very important in supporting the, the, the livestock-based um, livestock production systems. So if you look at the blue colors on this Eurostat map, it's easy to say, um, to see actually that um, grassland ecosystems are 
significantly spread across um, the UK and the Republic of Ireland. I think across the UK, um, grasslands cover about 36% of the land area. It goes up to 60% in Northern Ireland and up to 80% in the Republic of Ireland. So the, the, the point I want to make here is that the carbon sequestration potential of these grasslands it's very much related to the large extension of this land use um, across the UK and the Republic of Ireland. So the main question is, what is this carbon sequestration potential? So if we look at, um, if, we, if we look into the, the scientific literature over the last 20 years across Europe, um, many studies suggest that grassland soils can indeed sequester carbon, so they can act as carbon sinks. Um, but the, the, the carbon sequestration rates could be very variable. So if you look at the graph, um, this graph on, on the left side, which we presented a few years ago at the European Grassland Federation meeting in, in Cork, actually in, in Ireland, um, it shows that um, on the y-axis, we have the rate of change, carbon sequestration rates. And on the x-axis, we got the different findings from different studies. So if we look at the average uh, rates of carbon sequestration, these are 0.8 tons of carbon per hectare per year. But you can see that actually some of these grasslands sequester more and some others less, and probably they're not very different from, from zero. Um, on the right side of this graph, also, I put together um, findings from other studies across Europe. And again, we come up with carbon sequestration rates, which vary between 0.05 to 0.9 tons of carbon per hectare per year. So let's say uh, to, to up to 800, 900 kilograms um, per hectare per year. The reason of this variability is um, because actually partly because maybe we, we are not able uh, to measure rates of carbon sequestration properly because it, it takes time and it takes energy and it takes money, but also because of the interaction of different variables because rates of carbon sequestration depends on the management history of these grasslands. The current practices, how people are managing grasslands at the moment it depends on climate, it depends on um, soil type and so on. So that's why we have this variability. Um, so in, in the next four slides, then my intention was to um, show what, what we've been learning um, doing research in AFBI um, in relation to changes in carbon stocks in grasslands and especially in relation to very common uh, management practices. So the first one I like to focus on is very common, which is the application of organic amendments to soil, um, animal manure, animal slurries. And um, I want to show these uh, findings from a long-term grassland experiment that we established at Hillsborough, south of Belfast. In, uh, well, somebody established that in 1970 and it's still running. Uh, so it's basically 51 years old at the moment. Um, if you look at this graph, um, on the x-axis, we have time, so starting close to 1970, coming to 2020. And then on the y-axis, we have uh, soil carbon stocks um, per hectare. Um, I want you just to pay attention to the legend on the right of this graph, because this experiment has been receiving different applications of cattle slurries from high to medium to low. And also we got plots that never received any nutrient applications since 1970, the control. And then we had those receiving only NPK, uh, inorganic fertilizers. And then we have three different applications of pig, high, medium, and um, low. So the first, um, let's say take home message is that actually since the 1970, it looks like that all of these soils have been sequestering carbon, increasing, let's say increasing carbon stocks, regardless of the nutrient treatment. 
And then what we found is that in, in general, cattle um, slurry applications promote more carbon accumulation than other practices. So, um, and that could be related to the fact that when you apply um, so cattle are ruminants and they release in, in dung and decomposed stuff, cellulose, lignin, which actually is contributing to add carbon to the soil. And some of this carbon is probably incorporated into the soil, contributing to carbon accumulation and possibly sequestration. Um, it doesn't mean that then we need to go out and spread cow's slurry everywhere, because actually this is on the, the, the carbon side of the research, because if you apply too much slurry, then you're going to have problems with the nitrogen and the phosphorus. So we, we need to, um, and, and possibly leaching of these nutrients in, in, into fresh water bodies. So we need to find the right um, application, which actually could increase carbon accumulation and improve soil health at the same time and possibly other ecosystem services. Um, the second example I want to give is in relation to agricultural liming, which is basically the application of calcium and magnesium rich materials to soil. We do this because we want to improve soil pH, because improving soil pH has got benefits for uh, plant growth. Um, we've been finding multiple benefits above and below ground, including nitrogen use efficiency, um, and this evidence comes from um, the park grass experiment in England um, at Rothamsted. This is the longest grassland experiment in the world. And years ago, we went to Rothamsted and we got soil from these um, very old jars. And we basically um, measured the carbon content of this soil starting from 1876. And we did that comparing different soils which have been lined or not lined. Um, so if you look at this graph uh, on the y-axis, um, this is the bulk soil organic carbon. Again, carbon stocks per hectare. And then on the x-axis, we've got the time from 1876 to 2005. Um, so what, what we found is that um, soils receiving lime have got a higher, let's say, carbon sequestration potential or higher carbon stocks than plots not receiving lime. So this is a, this, these are mineral soils. These are not peatland soils. I wouldn't probably advise to add lime to peatland soils because it might cause carbon release from highly organic soils. But for, for mineral soils, this evidence um, and other evidence that we've been gathering, it looks like in the long term, lime could have a positive effect on um, carbon stocks, either by maintaining carbon stocks or increasing them, and also delivering uh, other benefits um, in relation to soil microbes, and as I said, on um, nitrogen use efficiency of these words. Um, so maybe there is potential to reduce nitrogen fertilization if lime is also applied. This is all actually ideas that would need to be tested more. Um, the other issue that actually it was mentioned before um, by um, Brendan and Harold is about the multi-species um, swords. So this is a practice that is becoming more common recently across the UK and the Republic of Ireland and has to do with biodiversity, but it is the value of biodiversity that has to be understood and tested across commercial farms. If you look at the graphs um, on the left side, the top one, and, and, and the one below, is like moving from a ryegrass monoculture, um, which is usually associated with lower efficiency in resource acquisition and use. And I mean nutrients, water, uh, and possibly sunlight. So less efficiency in using these resources. And moving towards a system where actually you have a higher species diversity, different species growing together with different rooting systems. So um, the key issue of this biodiversity, um, more diverse swords, is that actually 
you have species which utilize resources in different ways. Some of them is growing more in the winter or in the, in, in, in the cooler months. Some of them may be like legumes in the summer. Uh, they have different rooting systems. So they use nutrients and water and light in different ways. So they are more, um, let's say, effective in using resources, but also possibly more resilient against changes in, in climate. If you get a drought in the summer, it's very likely that they will recover faster and they won't lose as much biomass maybe um, that could be lost from a monoculture. Uh, this evidence on the right side, the, 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 the larger graph, it shows um, what we've been learning from two long-term experiments um, from Germany and from um, the United States. So um, basically um, you have species richness on the x-axis from one monocultures to up to 16 different species. And evidence shows that um, increasing the number of species, increasing biodiversity or having a combination of good species like legumes on one side and C3 or C4 grasses on the other side, you can deliver more ecosystem services in terms of productivity, um, yield stability, pest and weed suppression and, and, and so on. Um, I think we don't know enough about the positive effects of multi-species words in agricultural grasslands uh, because it's, it's never done before. So we, we need to continue and gathering data on, on from this side. Finally, my last um, example is from a land use change. Um, this is a long-term uh, uh, research platform that we have at Lockgo um, in Northern Ireland, um, where um, in 1989, a permanent grassland was actually um, transformed into like on one side, uh, a silver pastoral system and on the other side, a uh, woodland. So basically since 1989, then we had three different ecosystems that we could compare. Uh, a pasture, a silver pastoral system, and um, a woodland. So recently we went to these um, different plots, we collected soil samples, and we were looking at potential differences in soil carbon stocks across uh, these three different land uses. So what we found on the graph top right, um, in terms of soil carbon stocks between zero and 20 centimeter depth, we didn't find a significant difference um, across the three land uses, even though the grassland actually show um, higher carbon stocks than the silver pastoral trees and the woodland. Um, but we, what, what we also found, um, which was very interesting, is that um, this soil was actually sieved across different mesh sizes. So we could look at the carbon content of different fractions, different aggregates. And what we found is that um, the silt and clay carbon pool, which is the smallest fraction in the soil, was actually higher in the silver pastoral system and in the woodland. So this would suggest that that carbon pool, it could be, let's say, more resilient, more recalcitrant to climate change. It could stay in the soil for longer than, um, so, than, than carbon stored in, in other fractions. So there might be then a benefit from having trees um, in particular parts of, of, of the landscape. Um, and finally, I just wanted to conclude um, to suggest um, sort of like way forward if we want really to know more about how carbon stocks are changing through time, because this remains the, the most limiting aspect in our knowledge. So we need to know more how carbon stocks might be changing through time according to different management practices. So a few years ago, we published this study, which um, suggests um, to take this comprehensive approach. So you have, um, it could be done, you know, in Northern Ireland, the Republic of Ireland, you have landscape and you need to identify um, benchmark sites. These benchmark sites could exist already, long-term experiments, or could be chosen uh, within commercial farms. 
And then um, you can start actually new long-term experiments, five, 10, 15 years long. And then at the same time, you could run shorter term experiments. You know, you can have plots, you can add your lime, you can combine lime with slurry, you can have ideas to test, um, and that will help gathering data. And this data um, will be fed into like modeling, uh, different models, different approaches, in a way that actually everything is um, interacting and it does help to build up a data set and, and, um, and knowledge. I'm not gonna go into um, more details, but is the need to create this kind of like um, monitoring, reporting, verification system. But at this stage, you need um, different stakeholders. You need the government, you need industries, you need the farmers, you need the landowners, you need the scientists establishing these, um, let's say, um, all island carbon mon monitoring program um, to be able to, to measure soil um, organic carbon changes uh, over time. Um, yeah, I'm going to stop here. Yeah, thank you very much. Dario, thank you very much for that. And it just shows you, I suppose, maybe reinforces where Harold's frustration uh, stems from in the fact that he, as a landowner, he has uh, certainly an, a, a lot of assets from hedgerows to trees to his, his soils in terms of that can, can contribute positively uh, <coughs> to the carbon sequestration, but he's not getting any credit for it. Daryl, just before we move on to our next speakers, I, I would, and it's maybe slightly off topic, uh, the MRV that you talk about, the measure, report and verify, Northern Ireland has taken a very important step on that journey in the last number of weeks, actually, with an announcement by Agriculture Minister Edmund Putz. Could you maybe just update our, uh, our, our participants on, on that development and the significance of that? Yeah, well, this is a great initiative and it's actually what we need uh, at the moment, um, at least to start to get to know about soil carbon stocks across um, all Northern Ireland, basically. Um, so this is a very large soil scheme. It does involve uh, work on carbon, but also on um, different kinds of nutrients and potentially um, is going to be applied to 650, 700,000 fields um, across Northern Ireland. So it's quite um, uh, ambitious. Um, from a carbon perspective, um, I think the first um, objective is to measure soil carbon stocks or estimate carbon stocks because we cannot measure carbon stocks uh, down to a certain depth for such large amount of um, grasslands. So we're going to do, um, we're going to combine field work modeling to come up possibly with a map for Northern Ireland, which shows carbon stocks across different systems. And par part of this project is also aimed to compare changes in carbon stocks between this new sampling scheme and a previous one, which happened a few years ago. So maybe we can already see uh, or learn more about changes in carbon stocks in a number of um, farms across Northern Ireland. And then the modeling will help to produce estimates or understanding what factors might influence carbon sequestration rates according to the management history and other aspects. Um, yeah. Wouldn't it, wouldn't it be fantastic if we could do that map on an all-Ireland basis? And I, I see Brendan still on the, on the call there. So he, uh, he, uh, there, there, might be, there might be some move in that direction. But uh, Daryl, look, I think you've uh, a, very, uh, a very important uh, piece of research there and one that's going to come to the, to the fore more and more. I think what really strikes me from, uh, from even from your research, despite all the work that has been done, there are still a number of quite serious question marks and fundamental question marks marks around the whole area of carbon sequestration that we need to make sure that we get right at research level before obviously uh, going down at any pay, or at a significant pace uh, at farm level. But Dario, there's no doubt that your, your, your research work in AFB will be, will be informing the debate on this. And I think it's, it's great to see that type of research uh, coming to the fore at such an important time. So well done to you and all the team up in, in, in AFB. And thank you very much for your presentation this morning. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, uh, ladies and gentlemen, we, we've talked about 
the pace of technology and the need for technology. And there's no doubt in the same way we've seen research take on the, the challenges in relation to uh, uh, COVID-19. We've seen technology also take on a lot of the challenges to COVID-19. Who would have thought that uh, we would have been so, everybody would have been so afraid with teams and COVID passports and QR codes and whatnot. And there's no doubt that technology is going to play uh, the same role in helping agriculture solve uh, the challenges that it faces, as we mentioned uh, earlier in the in the discussion with Brendan in relation to to the rollout of the the existing technologies built around the Chagas Mac curve. There is no doubt that the precision monitoring, precision application of nutrients is going to become a critical part. And I think uh, the the project that the, that we're going to hear about now, the Dingle Peninsula Hub, uh, the Poultice Project, is something uh, that certainly. Uh, uh, excuse me, provides, uh, I suppose, a platform for us to build on and possibly build on at a national level. And I'm delighted before we go to our panel discussion uh, to have uh, uh, Deirdre Ballish here, manager of the Dingle Hub, to give us an overview of what the Dingle Hub is all about and indeed the EU Poultice Project, and then for us to talk to a number of the key participants in that in terms of what difference it's making at uh, at farm level and, and across the research system. So Deirdre, over to you. Thank you very much, Justin. Um, I'm uh, Deirdre de Valiche. I'm the manager of the Dingle Peninsula Hub, and we are involved in an EU project, Plutus. Uh, we're a sustainable innovation pilot, one of 11 um, sustainable innovation pilots across Europe. Um, I'd like to thank, uh, I suppose, the uh, Ludgate Hub for the invitation to speak today. I had been looking forward to a trip down to Skibbereen. It was my destination of choice um, for holidays uh, as a child, so maybe in time that will happen. Um, to give a bit of context, I suppose, to the, the Dingle Peninsula, um, we have a resident population of just over 12,500, but we do see visitors in excess of 1 million annually. So tourism um, is a very significant sector here, and it accounts for 30% of the local economy. Um, but our farm to fork is very much underdeveloped, and much of our agriculture product is not retained here on the peninsula. Um, the hub has coordinated a, a number of studies here, including an energy master plan and supported Northeast West Kerry development in a socioeconomic profiling um, report. And, and the things we're learning is that we know that um, 54% of our energy use relates to transport, but 49% relates to agriculture. Um, and I suppose that has... Um, um, encouraged us to look at initiatives in both those areas. The Dingle um, Peninsula Hub has a mission to build a creative, livable, sustainable and inclusive community, fostering a vibrant and diverse ecosystem of stakeholders to facilitate the creation and maintenance of well-paid year-round incomes on the Dingle Peninsula. And our agricultural incomes are very, very much a part of that. The Plutus project itself, as I mentioned, we're one of 11 um, participating sustainable innovation pilots across Europe. There are opportunities to learn from other areas here that are very similar um, to ourselves, um, in particular those that have close links with the, with the tourism sector. Um, Plutus aims to create, I suppose, opportunities for changes that can rebalance the, the value chain and agri-food um, system here. And it's a project that we're using to um, enable co-created solutions. So it's enabling the different sectors to, to work together to find the solutions that will work at a local level. Um, and one of the aims of the project is to use the data coming from the sensors to identify and, and market new products, um, specifically for farms um, uh, initiating new agri-food and agri-tourism businesses. The partners in this project are ourselves, the, the Jingle Peninsula Hub, um, Tagusk, the IFA, and our technology provider, NetBasa. Um, and there we have layered on um, additionality to the project as well, uh, supported by Kerry Agri Business through its links with the, with the Dingle Hub, um, and also looking at data analysis um, and verification under VistaMilk with the team at DCU connected in with Tagusk. 
So we were running um, phase one trials of these technologies for the past um, 18 months, just to uh, validate the sensors, verify the data coming off them, develop the protocols. And that was with six ambassador farmers here on the peninsula. The Plotus project will enable us to roll this technology now out to 30 farms. Um, its intention is to encourage new collaborations across um, the value chain between technology designers, data analysts and food service entrepreneurs. And I suppose the hub's role in that is to encourage and support the, the, the businesses that may be identified and emerge from this work. Um, it is to support uh, greater carbon efficiency on farms. So we know that uh, it is to support grassland management techniques that will do this uh, and also to uh, support increased profitability on farms. And there's an opportunity here to work with the 33 consortium partners um, through the Plutus project and I suppose bring that um, academic knowledge and expertise, bring it to a local level and enable it to work, to work for us here. To give you an overview of the technology that has been installed by NetPASA, um, we have uh, Lorawan Gateways uh, providing the communications on the six ambassador farms. Uh, this will move to narrowband IoT technology as the sensors have been further developed since our initial phase one trials. Uh, we have um, sensors on the milk tanks and on the slurry tanks. It's a Tekelec ultrasonic sensor. And we're using the Lebelium Smart Agri sensor. So we have weather stations uh, and we're obtaining soil moisture and soil temperature data as well. Um, so the overall cycle of this is that we sit down and we understand with the farmers and the tagus what are the requirements, uh, what do we need, we take a look, we, we engage and recruit the farmer, the, the 30 participating farmers, we're in the process of that at the moment, and we install the sensor technology on their land. Uh, then we acquire the data through the, the NetPlaza platform and the team at DCU are cleaning up that data um, and incorporating it with um, grass measurements from pasture base and looking at future or at forecasting from Metair and, and to bring all that together in a farm portal and then to enable the cycle as we've just um, released the first version of that uh, online platform of the data to work with the farmers again to see how does this address your needs how can we build decision making criteria on top of that and as the project progresses we'll be continuously refining that online data platform. So this is what it, what it looks like as the pre at present, um, and it will allow the farmers to analyze the flow of information and to use that data for decision support. There will be a lot of data analysis layered on top of this as we progress through the project. Um, so what are the, the data that we're taking? We're, we're taking um, rainfall, air temperature, and soil temperature. Um, we're taking soil moisture data, and um, we're taking pasture uh, pasture-based data, so we will be measuring the grass. The milk uh, tank sensor data as well, as I said, and it can be, it can be used to link um, pastures, uh, production on pastures to, to, the, to the amount of milk produced. And the slurry tank data can indicate days of storage uh, remaining in the tank and can relate to the soil and soil moisture and weather data. Uh, each farm as well will have a nutrient management plan to supplement this information. And there is the potential, I suppose, for individualized grass growth models for each farms, given that we're pulling in all this data. Uh, I'm just going to finish up here with uh, a nod to some of the complementary projects that are happening here on the peninsula as well. Uh, we'll have, we have a West Kerry Dairy Farmer Sustainable Energy Community, so that's over 90 members of the farming community, looking at energy efficiency on their farms and opportunities for renewable energy. We are looking at anaerobic digestion for use in transport markets here um, because it has such a, I suppose, a, a circular, circular benefits for the whole economy here. And we do have a creative climate action plan, plan, uh, funded project uh, where we will be putting an embedded artist who will uh, to work with uh, the farming community here to creatively engage with them over the course of the next year. Thank you very much.
I think you might be muted. Justin. I just realised I was <laughs> muted there. Probably, probably uh, didn't miss much. Uh, but just saying, your last innovation there sounds very interesting in terms of the creative artist. I think we all need to look at the the methods we use to communicate some of these highly technical things with mm. farmers. So well done, on, well done on that initiative, ladies and gentlemen. I'm delighted to be joined also now on a panel with. Uh, Ian O'Shea uh, from NetFasa, CTO with NetFasa, who uh, Deirdre mentioned uh, there to be the, the technology providers to the project, Denny Galvin, uh, uh, a farmer working with uh, with the group, and uh, Anya Mackin Walsh, uh, Rural Economy and Development Programme uh, Manager, <coughs> indeed, with Chagas. Denny, as, as the farmer in the group, I'm going to come to you first. Uh, I suppose for other farmers out here on, on uh, in the participants listening, maybe give us your first-hand experience of what it was like to be involved in a project like this. And, and I suppose maybe, first of all, why you made the decision to go ahead with it, because it is a big step to get involved in something like this. Uh, hi, Justin. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, um, I suppose I, I kind of got involved with the Dingle Hub, uh, um, as you know, um, on the steering committee for, nanorobic, for the anaerobic digester. And there's a fabulous feasibility study done on that. Um, on from that, uh, you know, we were looking at this farm ambassador uh, uh, program. So originally six, uh, six uh, farmers took part. And it was very interesting from, from the offset because, um, you know, weather stations were, were deployed on the farms. And, you know, we, we had the temperature of the soil, we had the wind speed, we had the rainfall, we had the wind direction. And, you know, these things are very important to farmers because, you know, if you go out in the spring to spread your fertilizer, well, it doesn't make a lot of sense to spread it into water because it gets diluted and it's gone. And if you haven't the right temperature in the soil, it uh, can be very, very important as well. Um, the, um, the, the sensor on the slurry tanks was very handy. Something I'd have done over the years is I dip my slurry tanks with, with a stick and I'd take a reading. You'd keep an eye on, you know, maybe you'd have to adjust the number of animals in the different shed to to um, to allow to get to the dates for the for the storage. And um, that was, you know, to have all that in an app on the phone and to be able to to take a look at you know daily recordings and and uh, weather trends we're on the peninsula here and and you know it's a long peninsula so what would happen maybe rainfall wise on one end of the peninsula may not happen on the other end of the peninsula and that's that you know can have a big bearing on on going out with slurry and stuff onto the land so uh, very very beneficial information coming back um, so do I yeah. get the sense, Denny, that you moved? It allowed you to move from, I suppose, being pro to to being proactive from reactive. You you had the tools on your phone in your hand, key decision making tools, whether it be about slurry storage, slurry application, nitrogen application. So it's about arming you with the tools that you needed. Definitely, yes. Um, you know, the buy-in. You know, the buy-in is 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 out there from the farming community. We 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 want to go forward and we want to get involved. But with this technology, like that's that's great information. You know, that that can help you make daily <coughs> decisions and weekly decisions. And uh, so, yes, very very important. Um, uh, big plus. Ian, one of the concerns farmers have when it comes to technology is that it's complicated and costly. Uh, as somebody in your line of business as a chief technology officer, maybe describe to us how this project, because it's that two-way flow of, of information, both back to, from the end user back to you guys and vice versa. How do projects like this make sure that the, that the technology is presented in a usable f format to the, to, to the end user, to the farmer in this case? For sure, Justin, the technology is complex, but you know, with the farmers <coughs> that came on board this project almost two years ago now, they were very clear on what they wanted and what they were what they want the requirements of what they wanted to see and when they wanted to see it. And then Denny in particular, I said, I want to see within an hour. I want to see what the conditions are. I want to see what the soil moisture is. I want to see what the, the soil temperature is. So the farmers were very clear in what they wanted to see. Now they don't need to understand the need to understand the ins and outs of the technology and the wireless complicated technology, but they knew exactly what they wanted to to see and what they wanted reported on the phone. So that's the stage that we, that we got to, 
over the almost 18 months of a project that we now are presenting the information to the farmers that they need in real time and they, they can make decisions. And you're right, the, the, it's a uh, technology is complicated. And one of the things that we learned uh, on the six farm project and Deirdre mentioned it on the call is that as we move from six farms to 36 farms, we're changing the technology. We're going to use narrowband IoT to actually get this information back from the sensors. And that's a lower cost technology. It'll mean that it's, it's, it's cheaper for the farmer. And this has come up a couple of times um, on Harold Kingston's discussion as well, that you know, this technology this information shouldn't cost a farm. It has to cost. And it's a, been a very important lesson so far as we go to 36 farms, that this technology is rolled out as cheap as possible mm. so that you know, if this is to go further, it, it, has to be, it has to be low cost. It's not going to work. So the connectivity for connecting these sensors back, for getting the information back and displayed, it has to be done in a very low cost way with little or, and I would say little or no cost to the farmer because mm. the information that can be got from these sensors is, I think it's, we, keep, we said together, Dini and uh, Deirdre and myself, that we still don't know fully the value of the data we're getting. And we will get more data as we go to 36 farms. And I think that one, I think one key point is that it's not the data just from one sensor, it's the data from the, all the sensors combined that provides the value. And what I would say is that Dario's last slide, his architecture slide there was very informative because what I saw in Dario's last slide was what the Dingle Peninsula, what's been gathered in this project as fitting in a small, not well, quite a significant subset of the information that's been gathered in the Pluto's project can be uh, a component of that larger uh, carbon sink architecture that he showed, that uh, Dario showed. So I think it, it kind of, for me, it showed that we we're on the right path here in the information <coughs> we're gathering, how we're using it. It's a very good point in, in what you said in, in terms of Dario. It was the monitoring, verifying, re yes. and reporting. Exactly. And this technology provides real information, the aggregated data set as to the activities that actually influence the, the end outcome, and it, and it joins uh, together. But Anya, I, I'm just keen in, in terms of in, in the Chagas role in this, and, and, and it also, that verification, the MRV that, that uh, Dario spoke about, there really is an opportunity for this technology to give end consumers, even if we go right through the whole blockchain, to be able to pick up a product and, and stem the whole way back. And, and that's something that, that, that you're obviously monitoring and, and, and very interested in. Certainly, Justin, and clearly as there is, there is an increased emphasis now, even in forthcoming policies such as farm to fork, biodiversity policies, et cetera, at EU level, is the importance for sustainability attributes when these are used to brand food for these to be verifiable for these to be evidence-based and that is precisely what companies such as Netfasa and the initiative uh, occurring in West Kerry that is exactly they're putting in the foundations for that uh, for those credence attributes to be used for the purposes of branding food but what we're particularly interested in um, the social science department here in Chagask for which I work is the importance of scaling up these initiatives, not only to other areas within Ireland, but also to other areas across Europe. And this is why the, this project that Deirdre referred to, it's one, of one, uh, it's one of 11 sustainability pilots across Europe occurring within the Plutus project. It's very important that we understand the dynamics by which these initiatives take root, the, what motivates people to become involved, and Dinny has explained that very well. What's important to me as a farmer? Why is this valuable to me? And unless those value mm. systems are, 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 provides the architecture around these projects and allow them to take root, unless we really understand what motivates people like Ian to become involved, the potential he sees in companies like Ian sees in these initiatives, the value, the, how Ginny articulates, well, this is important to me as a farmer. We have to understand the motivations of all the different actors all of the different diversity of skills and interests that combined give strength to these initiatives. That's the basis upon which we hope to replicate this elsewhere in Europe. So it's not really just about the infrastructure, the technology, the resources, it's understanding the values underpinning mm -hmm. it all. 
and just one comment in relation, uh, last comment in relation to that, it is the consumer perspective. Mm -hmm. So always being bound in and attuned to the consumer perspective, what consumers want, and including them as partners in these innovation processes. And Anya, do you see the potential, and we talked about the aggregated value, Ian mentioned the aggregated value, do you see a potential conflict or a potential challenge down the road of making sure that we've got the pop or foundation in place to ensure that farmers feel that they continue to own the data, that that data is not going to be commercialized further up the supply chain when it's aggregated or somebody's going to watch yes. Denny's tank and realize he needs to put in another one and come out and try to sell him another slurry tank or whatever the case may be. Uh, a bad example, but I think you get the point. But the ownership that we need to make sure that the data generators own the, the data in an aggregated form as well or have control over Yes, I think there are two important dynamics at play in the innovation process that we can be attentive to in answering your question there, Justin, which is a very important one. The first is what has already been referred to in, dis in today's discussions as the co-creation process, the co-design process. And that is really the mechanism by which uh, what Brendan Gleeson referred to as the systems-based approach if we were to look at that, a microcosm of what the systems-based approach involves in the ground, on the ground, it is the intersection between all of the various disciplinary professional uh, interests on the ground working together, Dini with Ian, with Deirdre as the intermediary, farm advisors from Chagask in the area, and how all of those knowledges and perspectives contribute to provide a more holistic solution on the ground. Now, a marked characteristic of the co-design or co-creation process is that interests of the actors are involved are accommodated in the process. In fact, that is, and that their interests are protected. So that goes back mm -hmm. to that data usage issue to which you're referring. They're partners in the innovation process. And by, by virtue of that, it is, it is expected that the process evolves in such a way that respects, protects, and represents their interests. I let you come in there. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's just a question for Ian, and, and I'm interested, Ian, in terms of learnings and these type of projects are all are are both ways. Like as as a technology company, uh, what what have you guys learned in terms of the biggest challenges? Uh, like just talking to you earlier, we we talked about battery life, about maintenance, about how the communication. But I suppose working with the likes of Denny and guys on the ground, what? What, what do you learn as a technology, as, a, a, as, a, as an IT guy, in terms of making sure this technology is usable and adaptable and, and has value? For sure, the, the technology, as you said, the technology that's deployed on farms, it must be durable. <coughs> the battery must last. It can't fail. And, and, there were, and we did have problems. And, we, and we've had, that's what these pilots are for, is to understand the sensors that work, the sensors that don't work. So that as you deploy this on a larger scale, you put out the sensors, that have performed well and the sensors that have not performed well you go back to the supplier and say this is not uh, working according to spec but we get that information as well from the farmers and the six farmers that were involved in this project to date have been very very supportive in the in, in what we've been going on the farms uh, looking at the sensors if we've had to replace the sensor so they've been very supportive and uh, i would say it's been more of an opportunity really but i suppose the, the, the big opportunity that i see from a technology person is and it goes back to Dario's diagram is this, this data, you combine this data from this, these sensors and from other sources of data. And that's where the real value is. You know, this is certainly our, our biggest learning uh, from the six farms pilots so far is that it's the combination of sensor data and the combination of farmer input. And also I suppose to, to emphasize as well is that the things that we measured on the farms, you know, has been driven by the farmers as well. So I think that that this has been driven from the ground up in Dingo. This has been driven from the ground up. It was the farmers that got involved early on and pushed it. And I think that when that happens, you get greater buy-in. When the the ideas and there's been three three workshops have just been held in the last couple of weeks for the next phase of the project, and even the the ideas that came from those farm discussions on the three on the three farm visits, there was more ideas that came out from the farmers and how and how things should be done for the next 30 farms. So the feedback is from the farmers, is what the information that they want is how this project has been, is, is been driven forward.
Jenny, from a farming perspective, if you look at the policy framework on which you operate, you get a grant for a new slurry tank, you get a grant for a head gate for a crush and and, and, Scott, uh, and what do you call it? There's, there's grants for and there's TAMS grants for a lot of stuff being rolled out on farms. But for the technology that you are, are deploying now in your farm, is there, and leaving aside the, if you were just a dual soap farmer going to buy this technology off the shelf, do you feel that the, the like for example, the TAM scheme is properly designed to actually incentivize the rollout of some of these technologies uh, on the farms? Or should they be given more consideration within? They should be given more consideration, definitely. <coughs> definitely. As Ian mentioned there, you know, uh, two of those um, two of those get-togethers on farm were held here in my farm, which was fine. Um, I've no problem talking to guys. Uh, that was for the additional 30, over 30 farmers. And, you know, look, one thing that came out was it, it relates back to Dario's um, thing there on, on the multi-species grasses and all the different types of grasses. So... Basically, you had a big, you have a big number of dairy farms, farmers involved in this and growing grass and fertilizing it and spreading slurry are very, very important to us. Um, pasture base would be something that's very, very important to us. So if we can relate, you know, how, how as 36 different farmers by adapting different things and by using the technologies that we can grow grass better, you, better utilization of grass gives a better return uh, in the milk tank in the end of the day. And our carbon emissions are per litre of milk and, and our, our carbon footprint of every farm is per litre of milk in the end of the day. And that's going to get more prominent going forward. So uh, like one of the things that was discussed by the lads, this was an idea from, a, from one of the lads that was here one day was, you know, and maybe put a transponder on two cows within the dairy herd because wherever all the cows go, two cows would go. If you map your land, if you map your land, even Herdwatch have, have a mapping system on there, um, an app for, that can be done. So you can see where, you know, if you'd have a multi-species lee or if you would have a, clo or a clover grass or if you would have an intensive, uh, you know, hybrid grass, so you could see exactly how the cows would relate to each. And you can watch, you get your results from, from, the, from the creamery and you can see your fat and protein and everything in relation to the, all this. So that to us would be, yeah, growing grass and pasture base and measuring the grass growth would be very, very important, uh, a big, big thing to us. Ian, I just want to come back to you just there, and I'll, I'll come to you maybe for, for, for a, bit, a wrap up, but Ian, one thing sometimes when I look at all this technology that concerns me is there's a piece happening over there, there's a piece happening over there, and there's 10 different pieces of data being gathered, but it's difficult for the farmer to join. The real part is when they're all joined together and, and then he can see, well, his cow is walking 20% more when she's in a lay or, or, or a, a hybrid uh, grass system verse, or tetraploid versus a, a multi-species sport or whatever. Uh, is... Do you think we're doing enough as a technology person, IT, do you think we're doing enough to actually provide a hub where all this data can be fed in and then given out to a farmer in a way that's actually really usable to him? Are we really tapping, are we tapping into the full value of the technology opportunity? No, I think we haven't started. Uh, a group <laughs> that, that completely that we're, we're gathering data in silos. Mm. But I think what we're doing here is the first step because in the six farms that are live today, there's different sensors. So there's a weather station, there's a milk tank sensor, there's a, a slurry tank sensor, and all the weather station information is soil moisture. And that is being, today, that is being aggregated per farm. Now, as part of the next stage, decisions will be made, and that's the DCU involvement in this project, is that decisions will be made using a combination of that sensor data from that single farm. So that is part of the next phase of the project. But can you imagine if you were to combine information from one farm, you know, from all, from all the other centers, from all the other farms, there is value there as well. And I think that, you know, this, there is, I, I think that's the big, the single biggest thing that we have learned on this project is that it is the combination of data and it's slicing and dicing the data and looking at it in different ways where you really see the value using a combination of low cost, robust, long battery life sensors 
that's where the value will be in the future, I think. And I do, to have finished, I do agree that there's a, a point where this information from right across the country could be sliced and diced and, dis and disseminated in a way that's of most value to the farmer and of most value to the other you know, players yeah. on, on this call, whether it's the government, it's the IFA or whatever. So certainly that's where we see there's, there's great potential for what's being done, what's being started on the Dingle Peninsula with the six farmers. And it's Deirdre, really, really, Deirdre, I'm going to wrap up with you because I know there's a lot of speakers uh, or a lot of listeners here might be going, well, how do I get started in my area on a similar project? What advice would you give any other regional or local groups that are thinking of getting involved in this space? Well, I suppose one of the things that we... Uh, we always hang our hat on is giving community agency. So the, the first thing we started with was we said, you know, the agricultural community is a very important sector here on the peninsula. Let's invite um, the, the farming community in. Let's hear what the needs are and the challenges. And then let's work together to find the solutions and then work from that to try and find the resources to implement those solutions. And, and that's the journey we've been on since day one. Um, and it started with an initial meeting with a small group of farmers here in the in the room here in the hub and progressed from there. So that that's where you start. But it's that word again, co-creation. You know, you, you have to understand the challenges with people and co-develop co the solutions along the way. Uh, the rest is a matter of identifying potential solutions. Deirdre, Ian, Anya and Dinny, thank you very, very much on behalf of all the participants for your time today and for giving us uh, such an insight into this. It's something, uh, look, thinking about it and, and just listening to the presentation, something I'd be very keen to thought that we follow up on in the Farmer's Journal. It's a very, very interesting project and, and well done to, to all on that and, and congratulations and wishing you every continued success into the future. Ladies and gentlemen, that brings our uh, webinar to a close and apologies uh, to those I've, I've overshot the runway a little. Uh, I'm not going to do any big uh, long conclusions or wrap ups other than to say, guys, I think when one thing we, we, we don't fully appreciate in this industry is access to the decision makers and being able to influence those. And I think having uh, the minister here this morning and having Brendan Gleeson uh, here uh, uh, down in Ludgate actually is a huge testimony to how important agriculture is taken uh, in, in, uh, <coughs> within, <coughs> within the government and within uh, the level of access that uh, the community and the industry has uh, to the Department of Agriculture. And I think whilst we may not always agree and we may want more and uh, everybody may have different views on policy and whatnot, I think we always have to recognise the level of access and the, the direct uh, commitment of the Department of Agriculture at all levels, right from, uh, from Brendan, the Secretary General, the whole way down, to engage positively and constructively with the industry. And I think that is a huge asset. It's also a huge asset when you see people like Harold Kingston being able to communicate his views so articulately uh, and not only that, but in a, in a well-informed matter uh, through having the likes of the resources uh, of, of the IFA to, to, to support farmers in, in doing that. And I think that is something that's going to come more and more to the fore in, in the years ahead in, in terms of making sure that we have the information at hand. And as, as, uh, as Harold said in his, in his speech, to make sure we continue to challenge, whether it be policymakers, scientists, whoever the case may be, farmers and and. Uh, the people influenced by some of these decisions should never have a fear of challenging and uh, trying to put forward and making sure that their views are heard on the ground. I think we also saw the importance of research within the industry, guys, and I think a lot of Darius' work there is, is very informative and it's going to be very important in terms of informing the debate going, going forward. It's always a challenge and at least a frustration that you always feel you wish the research was that one step further and more definitive, but I suppose it never actually does get there, but it's continued. So it's because it's always continuing to evolve. But I think uh, the, the, the need to evolve the research around carbon sequestration to reposition farmers in this debate and ensure that they get full credit for, for the environmental dividends that they are delivering is, uh, is critically important. And I have no doubt uh, the, the type of the innovation and the technology and the collaboration that we saw in terms of uh, the Dingle Hub and Deirdre and her team working with key stakeholders in the industry, that these platforms are an essential way forward in, in making sure that we do it. As, of course, our Ludgate and uh, Grania, thank you to you and all your team for, for bringing this event together uh, once again. And uh, to our participants, I hope you uh, you find it informative uh, and and also uh, challenging as well. Uh, Grania, back over to you. Thank you very much. Beautiful. Thank you, Justin. Uh, thank you for, for hosting. So 
so beautifully and closing out so beautifully there. I really appreciate your time and energy in navigating the discussion and, and debate that we had this morning. It was really interesting and stimulating. Um, a huge thank you to all of our speakers and panelists, Minister McConnellog, Secretary General Brendan Gleeson, Harry Kingston, Dario Fernara, Deirdre Nivalich, and Inoche and Dini Calvin and Anya McInwalch on, on their fantastic presentations and contributions. I think what, what struck me really was how the decade ahead will, while focusing on sustainable value growth with a strong foundation in the climate smart agri sector, in order to achieve all of that, we need collaboration and synergies from multiple stakeholders and actors uh, to drive the innovation and the data-driven solutions that we heard about this morning across the entire ecosystem, all striving towards the common goals, you know. So a huge thank you here from, from us in Ludgate for, uh, for this uh, insightful debate this morning. Um, before wrapping up, we'd love to get your feedback from all our attendees. So there should be a link in the chat panel for a very brief poll. It shouldn't take more than 30 seconds. So it would be great to get that feedback and it'll help shape future forums that, that we facilitate here from the Ludgate. Um, in terms of staying close to the agricultural sector and community, Ludgate wants to support these businesses. And therefore, if you are in this space and you want you know, some of the ideas that we're emerging from here, we're, we're definitely one of those actors that want to uh, bring some of this stuff to fruition in our region. So please reach out to us and we can see what we can do collaboratively together. We do have a lot of supports in here, whether it's just you know a desk or Wi-Fi or connectivity or business supports, networking and mentorship. So look forward to seeing you in here to avail of those particular services. Um, I, once again, I'd like to thank everybody for uh, participating here this morning. Uh, we have a webinar available on our website, like a lot of our virtual events over the last 12 months. So we're building up a beautiful inventory uh, of, of knowledge exchange there. And I think having that warehouse and curated material is available for us to tap into from time to time. So we did have a little competition um, to help promote uh, engagement here. So we'll be announcing those four lucky winners uh, in the next few hours. So stay tuned. Uh, finally, and most importantly, uh, I want to thank uh, the Dream team here in Ludgate for making today happen. We're, we're a small team, so it's a case of everybody Hands on tech, uh, on deck, and so uh, a particular shout out to Fiona Ryan, Elma Connolly, Mary Burke, Callum Donnelly, Tracy Daly, and of course Maeve Buckley from AIB, Enda Buckley from Carberry, Harold Condon and Lorcan Bannon from IFAC. IFAC opened their offices in Skibreen 18 months ago and are only two doors down the road from us here in Ludgate. So we're delighted to have them as neighbours and, and look forward to future collaborations with them. Uh, finally, a big thank you to AIB, uh, Maeve and John, for your continued uh, and ever-present support to Ludgate. And we really, really value that partnership. And uh, you, you guys are doing great things for the agricultural community down here. And I think we were able to showcase some of that this morning. So once again, thanks to everybody for joining us this morning. And uh, be safe. And uh, if it's not too early, can I say happy Christmas? Thanks. Thanks, guys. Thank you.